Hello friends, welcome back. So now we are going to discuss a topic that is invoice and time of supply. So this is concept block number six. So please refer to this in page number 135. Please refer to this in page number 135. So we have already completed up to input tax credit and we are left with small small topics so that we are going to complete now. The first one is invoice and time of supply. This invoice and time of supply deals with, so when a particular transaction is chargeable to GST, say I have rendered a service, that particular service is taxable on a particular date and that date falls in a particular month. Then for that month, I need to discharge the liability by 20th of the next month because 20th of the month following every month is the due date of furnishing. GST or 3B. So that will also be taken as the due date of payment of GST. Got it? So therefore, first we need to see what is the transaction and for the transaction, what is the time of supply? And if the time of supply for a particular transaction falls in a month, we need to pay GST by 20th of the month following every month. Then this time of supply in case of goods is given under section 12 and in case of services, it is given under section 13. So section 12 and 13 deals with time of supply in case of goods and services. Now, what is the objective of time of supply? Time of supply is to determine the rate at which we need to pay GST. So because there are different dates on which the transaction takes place. On one date we raise invoice, on another date we receive the payment, on one date we enter into contract. So at different dates, there will be different rates of GST. So which rate to be taken? Say at the time of raising invoice, the rate of GST could be 18. And at the time when we receive the payment, the rate could be 5%. So therefore, due to that reason, we need to know what is the relevant date for determination of rate of GST. So that should be taken as a time of supply. So we need to first determine time of supply and that time of supply, whatever is the date on which the rate of GST is there, that is only relevant. So time of supply first is to determine the due date already we discussed. Second is to determine the rate of GST. The third objective of time of supply is to determine the exchange rate. So whenever the transaction is denominated in foreign currency, we need to find the time of supply for the transaction and convert into Indian rupees. Okay, so using uh, uh, this CBIC rate or GAP rate. So CBIC rate for goods and GAP rate, generally accepted accounting principles rate for services. So this aspect we saw in the valuation, okay, value of supply. So what is the objective of time of supply? So time of supply is to determine, time of supply is to determine what? So time of supply is to determine, to determine, time of supply is to determine due date of GST, due date of GST and then rate of GST and then exchange rate exchange rate okay so time of supply is relevant to determine the due date of gst rate of gst exchange rate that is the purpose of time of supply okay now this time of supply is in turn depend upon invoice here so if for a transaction if i need to arrive at the time of supply first i need to arrive at the invoice that provisions related to the due date of invoice is given under section 31 okay so now what we are going to see is the due date of invoice because the time of supply is sometimes due date of invoice or actual date of invoice whichever is earlier so therefore due date of invoice we need to arrive and then it will be easy for us to determine the time of supply so that due date of invoice is given under section 31 so now what we are going to see is what is the situation and for the situation what is the due date of invoice okay so now concentrate on to that section 31 deals with due date of invoice section 31 deals with due date of invoice and that due date of invoice in case of goods is given under section 31 subsection 1 subsection i know 4 and subsection 7 in case of goods so section 31 deals with due date of invoice so this section 31 is divided into two groups 
in case of goods in case of services okay so in case of goods what will be taken and in case of services what will be taken in case of goods and in case of services in case of goods and in case of services so what will be taken as the due date of invoice in case of goods first we have section 31 subsection 1 section 31 subsection 1 normal cases section 31 subsection 1 normal case section 31 subsection 1 normal case and then we have section section 31 subsection 4 so 147 subsection 1 subsection 4 and subsection 7 deals with due date of invoice in case of goods so this is continuous supply of goods this is continuous continuous supply of goods continuous supply of goods that is given in section 31 subsection 4 whereas section 31 subsection 7 section 31 subsection 7 that is sale on approval or on return basis goods sent on sale on approval or on return basis sale on approval sale on approval or on return on return basis so what will be taken as the due date of invoice in normal case we need to check whether supply involves movement of goods or supply does not involve movement of goods what is the meaning of supply involves movement of goods under the contract of supply under the contract of supply goods will be transported from one place to another place for delivery to the recipient that is supply involves movement of goods so as per the contract i need to transport the goods from one location to another location and deliver the goods example so flipkart and amazon will be coming under supply involves movement of goods because we place the order and they deliver it to our place so therefore they take care of the transportation so that is example of supply involves movement of goods so the sale is concluded only when the recipient receives that goods okay so in that case if supply involves movement of goods supply involves movement of goods supply does not involve movement of goods supply involves supply involves movement supply involves movement of goods supply supply does not involve so when supply involves movement of goods what should be taken as the due date of invoice the due date of invoice will be that is at the time of removal that is the due date of invoice at the time of removal at the time of removal suppose if supply does not involve movement of goods if supply does not involve movement of goods then what should be taken then we need to take at the time of delivery see that is the due date which means on or before the date we need to make the payment uh, sorry we need to raise the invoice on or before the date we need to raise the invoice that is the meaning of that statement okay so at the time of delivery at the time of delivery will be taken as the due date of invoice so first what we have seen what will be taken as the due date of invoice if it is good section 31 subsection 1 normal case supply involves movement of goods at the time of removal supply does not involve movement of goods at the time of delivery suppose if it is continuous supply of goods so continuous supply of goods means what well, there will be successive supply of goods for which the payments are settled on a periodical basis say for example there is one provision store and there is a restaurant that restaurant will be purchasing you know provisions on a regular basis continuously they will be purchasing on a daily basis on a fortnightly for every 15 days once or every month month once so they will be settling the payment so how much transactions are happened in that month so they will be giving an account statement 
and the hotel or the restaurant will check and then they will make the remittance so that is known as continuous supply of goods okay so in continuous supply of goods what will happen there will be successive supply of goods for which the payments are settled on a periodical basis that is known as continuous supply of goods so in case of continuous supply of goods we need to take now as and when the account statement is issued or as the case may be payment is received so in case of continuous supply of goods what will be taken as the due date of invoice as and when account statement as and when account statement is issued as and when account statement is issued or as the case may be as the case may be payments are received as the case may be payments are received payments are received okay clear as and when account statement is issued or as the case may be payments are received so that will be taken what does it mean so in our example that uh, restaurant and the provision store example so provision store will be giving account statement 15 days once so as and when provision store gives account statement so that date should be taken as the due date of issuance of invoice sometimes what the provision store person will say sir as you are purchasing on a daily basis so therefore you do one thing for five days once you pay some 5000 rupees as an ad hoc amount and in 15 days once we will settle so therefore five days once so an ad hoc amount will be paid five days once an ad hoc amount will be paid so therefore that five days once whatever ad hoc amount that is paid so for that 5000 they need to raise the invoice you understood or not so as and when the payments are received or as the case may be account statement is issued that will be taken okay then next sale on approval or on return basis what is the sale on approval or on return basis so we will be sending the goods to the recipient's place recipient will check the goods and if he likes the goods he will purchase otherwise he will not purchase that is known as sale on approval or on return basis understood or not so in case of sale on approval or on return basis what will be taken as the due date of invoice so at the time when supply takes place when the supply takes place whenever buyer accepts at the time of supply a at the time of supply at the time of supply so what is at the time of supply means accepted by buyer at the time of supply at the time of supply or b at the time of supply or b what is it b so that is six months from the date of removal why because the buyer may take one year or two years also to accept so until that point of time that time only time supply will take place until that point of time garment will not wait so six months from the date of removal six months from removal six months from removal whichever is earlier whichever is earlier will be taken what it at the time of supply or six months from removal whichever is earlier will be taken as the due date of invoice when in case of sale on approval or on return basis okay so this will be taken as the due date of invoice understood in case of goods now what is the meaning of at the time of supply as and when the buyer accepts as and when the buyer accepts or six months from the rate of removal whichever is earlier in case of services in case of services we need to refer section 31 subsection section 31 subsection 2 section 31 subsection 2 so what will be taken as the due date of invoice in case of services normal case normal case normal case we need to check we need to check whether it is banking or insurance sector if it is banking or insurance sector 45 days from the date of completion if it is any other services banking or insurance if it is banking if it is banking or insurance 
if it is banking or insurance we need to take what 45 days from the date of completion banking or insurance 45 days 45 days from date of completion so from the date of completion within 45 days so the invoice to be issued if it is other services here if it is other services when then in case of other services that should be within 30 days from the date of completion 30 days from date of completion will be taken what it so in case of banking and insurance 45 days from the date of completion in case of other services 30 days from the date of completion so this will be taken as the due date of invoice in case of services normal okay whereas in case of continuous supply of services what is it continuous supply of services we already know continuous supply of goods like that continuous supply of services means when it takes more than three months to complete a service is known as continuous supply of service okay so in case of services in case of services that is section 31 subsection 5 continuous supply of services continuous supply of services what will be taken as the due date of invoice so it depends here what is that see continuous supply of service means what first we need to understand that so it takes more than three months to complete and involves periodical payment obligations okay so when you join for ca intermediate coaching ca intermediate coaching will be for how many months here six months usually six months so it takes more than three months to complete the service and it involves periodical payment obligations means they are asking for installment facility they are giving installment facility then it will be known as continuous supply of service okay so service which takes more than three months to complete service which takes service which takes more than three months more than three months to complete more than three months to complete and involves periodical payment obligations and involves periodical payment obligations periodical payment obligations okay periodical payment obligations service which takes more than three months to complete and involves periodical payment obligations is known as a continuous supply of service in case of continuous supply of service we need to take you know due date of invoice depending upon the situation what is that situation sir that is if if the payments the payment date that installment date is ascertainable from the contract we need to check if the due date of installment is ascertainable from contract due date of installment due date of installment ascertainable ascertainable from contract if the due date of installment is ascertainable from the contract what should be taken the due date of installment will be taken as the due date of invoice so what will be taken as due date of invoice here what will be taken as due date of invoice the due date of installment the due date of installment will be taken as the due date of invoice got it suppose if due date of payment is not ascertainable from the contract due date of installment not ascertainable from the contract due date is not ascertainable not ascertainable then what should be taken as the due date of invoice the due date of invoice is nothing but the due date of invoice is nothing but as and when the payment is received so installment receipt date installment 
receipt date will be taken. So the due date of invoice is installment receipt date. Suppose if the due date of installment is not ascertainable from the contract we understood, what if, if the installment is linked to completion of an event? Say for example, construction sector you take, upon completion of first floor you have to pay this much, upon completion of second floor you have to pay this much, upon completion of painting you have to pay this much, like that. So, if installment is linked to, installment is linked to completion of event, installment is linked to completion of event, completion of event, installment is linked to completion of event, then what will be taken as the due date of invoice? So, the due date of invoice will be, the due date of invoice is nothing but, so when installment is linked to completion of an event, the due date of invoice is nothing but the date of completion of such event. Date of completion, date of completion of such event that will be taken, put it. So that will be taken as the due date of invoice. Hope you are understanding it. Then the last case that is, the last case that is cessation of service. Section 31 subsection 6. Section 31 subsection 6 that is cessation of service. In case of cessation of service, what is that we need to do? What is cessation of service? Whenever the service gets completed abruptly. So that is service is not completed. So service is stopped. Service is stopped abruptly. That is known as cessation of service. Okay. For example, you know one service provider starts providing the construction services and he stops it and he says, no sir, I cannot do. And generally it happens in movie industry. So what a director will do? Director will start making the movie and there will be a conflict between the director and hero. So what hero or director will do? They will say, no, I will stop providing the service. That is known as cessation of service. In case of cessation of service, what will be taken as the due date of invoice? Immediately upon cessation, immediately upon session, no need to wait for 30 days and all, immediately upon cessation, immediately, immediately upon, immediately upon cessation will be taken with respect to proportionate amount retained, with respect to proportionate amount, with respect to proportionate amount retained. So that will be taken. Therefore, total six subsections are there. So subsection 147 is in case of goods and 256 in case of services. So one is normal cases. Supply involves movement of goods at the time of removal. Supply does not involve movement of goods at the time of delivery. Then subsection 4, continuous supply of goods. So continuous supply of goods means whenever there are successive supply of goods for which the payments are settled on a periodical basis as and when the account statement is issued by the supplier or payments received as the case may be. In case of sale and approval or return basis, at the time of supply means whenever the buyer accepts or six months from the date of removal, whichever is earlier. So that will be taken as a due date of invoice in case of goods. That three provisions we completed. Then we moved on to the services. Normal case, suppose if it is banking or insurance, you take 45 days from date of completion. If it is other services, within 30 days from the date of completion. And then continuous supply of service. In case of continuous supply of service, what is continuous supply of service? A service which takes more than three months to complete, not only that, and should involve installment facility. Then only it will be called as a continuous supply of service. Now what you need to see. For example, let's take construction of an immobile property. I'm a contractor, you are my recipient. Now you are paying the contract price in installments. How that is paid? I'm telling that the time limit. So by June 30th, you have to pay this much. By August 30th, first you have to pay this much. And by September 30th, you have to pay this much. Like that, I am telling in the contract itself as to how the contract price is payable. So that particular date itself, whatever is there in the contract, that particular date itself will be taken as the due date of invoice. Then, suppose if the date is not there in the con contract, but the date is like uh, the installment is linked to completion of an event, like that it is given. That is, for example, upon completion of the first floor, you have to pay this much. Upon plastering, you have to pay this much. Upon electrical fittings, you have to pay this much. Like that, 
they are telling completion of an event. Whenever that event gets completed, that will be taken as the due date of invoice. If nothing is there, as and when the payments are received. This is in case of continuous supply of services. Then in case of, you know, section 31, subsection 6, succession of service. Succession means abruptly stopping the service. If any amount is retained for that amount, immediately upon succession, the invoice needs to be issued. So this will be taken as the due date of invoice. Okay. Now, this one subsection is missing, that is 31 subsection 3, that is related to other documents related to the invoice. So, these are the subsections that contains the provisions of due date of invoice. Now, what we are discussing is that we are connecting this. One second. We are connecting this to time of supply. Sir, what will be taken as the provisions of time of supply? So, time of supply in case of goods is given under section 12 and in case of services is given under section 13, correct? So, now have a look into this section 12. See, I am just giving you the arrangement of the sections for easily to remember. So, the provisions of time of supply, the provisions of time of supply differs in case of goods and services with respect to only few cases, not all. With respect to few cases only, there is a difference in the provision. Let's try to understand that. So, time of supply in case of goods is given under section 12. So, section 12 deals with time of supply in case of goods. TOS in case of goods. TOS in case of goods is given under section 12. Whereas, section 13, section 13 deals with Time of supply in case of services. Time of supply in case of services is given under section 13. In that section 12 subsection 2, time of supply under forward charge mechanism. As per section 12 subsection 2, we have time of supply in case of FCM. And even 13 subsection 2 also time of supply in case of FCM. So, in case of FCM, we have the provisions, okay. So, section 12 subsection 1, what does 12 subsection 1 and 13 subsection 1 says? So, these two has the common provisions, that is, liability to pay GST depends upon time of supply, okay. Liability to pay GST, liability to pay GST is on time of supply. Where is this information given? This information is given in 12 subsection 1 and 13 subsection 1. So, it is common. There is nothing in that. Then section 12 subsection 2 and 13 subsection 2. Time of supply in case of forward charge mechanism. TOS in case of FCM. So, we need to determine the time of supply in case of FCM using subsection 2. Then section 12 subsection 3 and 13 subsection 3. Section 12 subsection 3 and section 13 subsection 3. So, deals with time of supply in case of RCM. Deals with time of supply time of supply in case of RCM. So, time of supply in case of RCM is given under subsection 3. Then, subsection 4, subsection 4 deals with time of supply in case of vouchers. Section 12, 4 and 13, 4 both deals with the same provisions. Time of supply in case of vouchers, time of supply in case of vouchers. Then next, section 12.5 and 13.5, what does it deal with? Time of supply in case TOS cannot be determined as per preceding subsections. If the time of supply cannot be determined as per preceding sections, TOS, if it cannot be determined, if it cannot be determined under preceding sections, under preceding subsections. When it is not possible, when the invoices are not properly maintained, it is not possible. 
TOS if it cannot be determined under preceding subsections, preceding subsections, then it is subsection 5. Then subsection 6, section 12 subsection 6 and 13 subsection 6 deals with time of supply in case of time of supply in case of addition by way of interest or late fee. Generally interest on late fee is there na? Time of supply in case of interest or late fee or penalty. Interest or late fee or penalty. For what? For delay in a receipt of consideration. For delay in receipt of for delay in receipt of consideration for delay in receipt of consideration we have you know interest late fee which we discussed in section 15 subsection 2 clause d so addition by way of interest late fee penalty in that case the time of supply will be determined as per subsection 6 now if you see the time of supply in case of subsection 4 subsection 5 and subsection 6 will be same so, this subsection 4, subsection 5 and subsection 6 will be same here. No change in that. Okay. So, it will be the same and let it be goods or services. In the sense like subsection 4, whatever is there for goods, the same provision is there for services. Subsection 5, whatever is there for goods, the same is there for services like that. So, only in case of 12 and 12.2 12 and 12.3, 12 that is FCM, RCM only, the provisions differ between goods and services. So, provisions are same. Provisions are same, provisions are same between goods and services, between goods and services, okay. So, between goods and services, the provisions will be same. That is with respect to this here, in case of time of supply, arrangement of sections, you hope you got. Subsection 2, FCM, subsection 3, RCM, subsection 4, vouchers, subsection 5, if you cannot determine as per preceding subsections. Subsection 6, interest or late fee or penalty for delay in receipt of consideration, okay. Now, I am starting with FCM, time of supply in case of forward charge mechanism. Under forward charge mechanism, who will pay GST, liability to pay GST is on the supplier, okay. So, what will be taken? So, it is simple, yeah. Due date of invoice or actual date of invoice, whichever is earlier will be taken, simple, okay. So, that I have given already, please see. Time of supply in case of 12 to when 12 to will come, goods the FCM. So, due date of invoice or actual date of invoice, whichever is earlier, but the date of payment is irrelevant. Always we need to take. So, what is the actual date on which invoice is issued and what is the due date by which the invoice should have been issued? What is the due date of invoice in case of goods? Subsection 1, subsection 4, subsection 7 already we have completed. That only I linked. Subsection 1, supply involves movement of goods, supply does not involve movement of goods, then continuous supply of goods, goods taken on, sale on approval or on return basis. Okay, already we discussed, I just linked it there. So, therefore, how to determine the due date of invoice, depending upon the transaction, check whether it is supply involved movement of goods, then at the time of removal, supply does not involve movement of goods, at the time of delivery, if it is continuous supply of goods, as and when the account statement is issued or payment is issued as the case may be, if it is, you know, Sale on approval or on return basis at the time of supply of six months from date of removal, whichever is earlier. Like that, we need to determine. But the date of payment is relevant. Okay. Then, so therefore, whenever we receive some advance, in case of goods covered under FCM, we receive some advance, but we deliver the goods at a later point of time. Now, on the basis of advance, should we pay GST? Or on the basis of delivery, we need to pay the GST. That is what will be the time of supply. Advance is relevant. I'll tell you, for example, you placed an order with me on 28th May. I delivered the goods to you on 5th June. 5th June, I handed over the goods. Supply involves movement of goods. Now, even though I received payment in the month of May, but I am not required to pay GST because the date of payment is relevant. And as and when the goods are handed over, that is at the time of removal. So, what is the time of removal from my place? It is in June month. So, therefore, June only will be taken as a time of supply even though payment is received in May month. Okay. That is in case of goods. Now, in case of goods covered under RCM. So, for what we have seen, goods covered under FCM. In case of goods covered under RCM, what we need to do? Earlier of the three dates. 
so when it is rcm who is liable to pay gst recipient so the time of supply should not be interpreted from supplier point of view the time of supply should be interpreted from the recipient point of view so as and when recipient receives the goods as and when recipient makes payment to supplier or 31st day from the date of invoice whichever is earlier so whenever recipient receives the goods so he will be receiving goods and he will be mentioning an inward register in that whenever he enters that day or as and when he makes payment to the supplier that payment date or 31st day from the date of invoice whichever is earlier will be taken as the time of supply now suppose if he pays advance if the recipient pays advance so whether that advance will be taken as the time of supply yes because here date of payment is there so therefore whether gst payable on advances in case of goods covered under rcm yes that's what i have given gst payable on advances in case of goods covered under rcm but under fcm it is not required okay sir where is it given as 30 days 31st day so date immediately following 30 days okay and date of receipt of payment means the date on which payment is made to supplier like that you need to understand so date of payment so this receipt of payment is confusing so you can omit that so this receipt of payment you can omit and you can just remember date of payment to the supplier okay then what is the meaning of date of payment to the supplier date of entry in the books of recipient that is date of entry or date of debit in their bank account whichever is earlier will be taken okay then next time of supply in case of services covered under fcm so i am doing a quick recap here in case of goods covered under fcm what should be taken due date of invoice or actual date of invoice whichever is earlier in case of goods covered under rcm the date on which recipient has received the goods the date on which recipient made payment to the supplier or 31st day from the date of invoice whichever is earlier only two points now we are moving on to services services again what we need to see so fcm rcm subsection 2 fcm subsection 3 rcm okay subsection 2 fcm we need to check whether invoice is given within the due date or not what is the due date of invoice already we know banking and insurance 45 days other cases 30 days continuous supply of service different due dates and cessation of service like that we know the due date of invoice whether invoice is given within the due date or not you need to check if invoice is given within the due date then actual date of invoice or date of payment whichever is earlier that is this if invoice is issued within the due date time of supply shall be time of supply shall be earlier of the due dates actual date of issuance of invoice or date of receipt of payment whichever is earlier what is the meaning of due date of invoice we have all the provisions this chart already we discussed i have just linked it here then suppose if the invoice is not issued within due date what will happen the date of completion date of completion or date of payment whichever is earlier will be taken as the you know time of supply date of completion not date of invoice date of completion or date of payment whichever is earlier will be taken and then next in case of services covered under rcm so in case of services covered under fcm what we need to do just check whether invoice is given within the due date or not yes given within the due date then take actual date of invoice or date of payment whichever is earlier no it is not given within the due date take date on which service is completed date of completion or date of payment whichever is earlier okay if it is rcm services covered under rcm generally in case of rcm goods we have three points the date on which goods are received but here we don't have service or receive second point the date on which payment is made that same date on which payment is made to supplier there it is 31st day here it is 61st day okay that's the difference date on which payment is made to supplier or 61st day from the date of invoice whichever is earlier only two points is there this is in case of services covered under rcm okay now whenever you see the question first you need to identify whether it is goods or services and then if it is goods or services the next step is whether it is fcm or rcm and accordingly you need to apply the provision and arrive at the answer okay then whenever it is subsection 4 subsection 5 and 6 there is no problem because in that case we will be taking the time of supply common between goods or services in case of vouchers what is vouchers sir generally when you purchase some goods they will be giving a gift voucher which can be redeemed against next purchase or sometimes 
you know rather than purchasing any product we will be purchasing the voucher and gifting it to one person so that person will redeem in that shop using that voucher that is what is known as voucher so usually that is gift vouchers okay now whenever you give that voucher whatever is the amount for that we can redeem the voucher to that extent we don't have to pay and the remaining amount we need to pay that is the concept of vouchers okay now voucher is a consideration try to understand voucher is a consideration against supply of goods or services voucher as such is not supply of goods or service for example i am giving you a voucher 500 rupees worth of voucher i am giving to you that is not supply but you will redeem that voucher and purchase some goods or services purchase some goods so this voucher 500 rupees will be taken as consideration for the supply of goods now for example you know i have a garment shop you came to my garment shop and you purchased garments for 5000 rupees i gave a voucher of 500 rupees and you are coming next time and you purchase 1000 rupees worth of garments okay 700 rupees worth of garments for example 700 rupees worth of garments you purchase and you paid 500 rupees as voucher and 200 rupees as cash now i should pay gst on on 200 or on 700 because what i received is only 200 in cash remaining 500 i am getting in the form of voucher so therefore should i pay gst on 200 or on 500 that's the point of dispute we need to pay gst on 700 not on 500 not on 200 but both why even voucher should be treated as a consideration against supply of goods or services so voucher treated as consideration voucher treated as consideration treated as consideration treated as consideration against supply of treated as consideration against supply of goods or services okay so voucher will be treated as consideration against supply of goods or services so therefore we need to pay gst in my example on 700 200 rupees cash on 500 rupees voucher is received as a consideration now for 200 rupees what will be the time of supply determined as per normal normal provisions subsection 2 okay whereas for voucher what should be taken as a time of supply check whether it is identifiable voucher or non identifiable voucher what is an identifiable voucher again which product or service it is redeemed is known at the time of issuance of voucher so i am giving a voucher say for example dominos dominos is give a, is giving a voucher one medium pizza or one regular pizza so therefore again which product or service you are going to redeem that i know now itself so on the date i issue the voucher that date itself i treat that the pizza is sold and i will pay gst therefore the time of supply is at the time of issuance of voucher identify a voucher at the time of issuance of voucher because what is the deeming fiction i am taking at the time when i give the voucher i am understanding i am considering that the pizza is sold and i will pay gst that is identifiable non identifiable means what it can be redeemed against any product or service so i don't know against which product or service you will redeem so therefore whenever you redeem at the time only the time of supply arises so in case of identifiable voucher at the time of issuance of voucher in case of non identifiable voucher at the time of redemption now in case of identifiable voucher what will happen you might get a doubt sir in case of identifiable voucher it so happens that it so happens that we pay gst now itself but what if that person is not redeeming then unnecessarily we pay gst that we can get as a refund okay that we can get as a refund if he is not redeeming suppose suppose if it is non identifiable voucher anyhow time of supply is at the time of redemption until the time he redeems we will not pay gst if it is not at all redeeming so we will not pay gst suppose if we have collected any amount for sale of that voucher so that is consideration without any supply okay so we will sell the voucher na we will sell the voucher so now we get any consideration on that we don't have to pay gst because voucher 
when it is redeemed then only it is treated as consideration against supply of goods or services that is in case of you know vouchers then subsection 5 in case time of supply is not ascertainable as per any of the preceding subsection then what will be taken as the time of supply sir why it is not ascertainable because the details of the invoice payment is not there means that person try to evade payment of gst with respect to the transaction then only it will happen so applicable in case of evasion of gst by a taxable person usually it is applicable in case of evasion of a gst by a taxable person so because when they try to evade escape from payment of tax they will not maintain all these records now in the accounts now in that case if department identifies if department identifies they will be you know asking them to pay gst now what will be taken as the time of supply we need to see whether that person is a registered person or unregistered person who that person who evaded payment of tax if that person is a registered person he will be filing returns by one due date so that due date of filing returns will be taken the due date of filing returns will be taken as the you know time of supply if the person is not filing any returns if that person is not filing any returns when he will not file any returns if he is an unregistered person he will not file any returns then in that case we need to take we need to take the date on which okay the date on which he makes the payment that itself is a time of supply please see periodical return has been filed who will pay periodical return only a registered person then the due date of filing such return will be taken as a time of supply if periodical return is not required to be filed the date on which he makes a payment that date will be taken as a time of supply so mainly this is for what purpose to determine the rate of gst and the interest computation mainly for that because whenever the time of supply comes that month next month 20th is a due date so thereafter only interest needs to be computed mainly for that reason it is given then next 12 subsection 6 and 13 subsection 6 in case of addition to value in the form of interest late fee etc for delay in payment of consideration in that case what should be taken as and when you receive that interest or late fee you need to pay gst so for the first time we are learning something where gst is payable on receipt basis this point already told in value of supply also that is this interest or late fee we are not required to pay on accrual basis gst on interest and late fee we need to pay on receipt basis not on accrual basis so only when we actually receive we need to pay gst otherwise we are not required to pay gst on this okay so therefore this is the time of supply provisions under subsection 2 to subsection 6 okay this much you need to remember after this certain special points so generally what will be taken as the date of payment from supplier point of view if you see date of payment means the date on which supplier has entered the entry in the books or the date on which supplier's bank account gets credited whichever is earlier what will be taken as the date of payment by the recipient the date of entry in the books of the recipient or date of debit in the bank account of the recipient whichever is earlier will be taken okay so date of entry in the books or date of credit in the bank account if it is supplier point of view if it is recipient point of view date of entry in the books or date of debit in the bank account whichever is earlier will be taken you understood then in case of goods covered under fcm in case of goods covered under fcm on advances gst is not payable and gst is payable only upon invoice why so that's what we are saying date of payment is omitted due date of invoice or actual date of invoice whichever is earlier due to that reason but in case of services under fcm gst is payable on advances this we know now there is one special point please in case of services we need to pay gst on advances say you know i am uh, taking some fees from you for classes okay if 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 i am taking some fees for conducting the class of course i am not collecting one rupee also from you if at all i collect if at all i collect some amount from you for taking the classes now whatever money that i am collecting now now that will be taken as the time of supply 
even though the batch is completed next month but this month will be taken as a time of supply because yes the payable on advances in case of service what has happened usually in case of post paid mobile bills credit card bills and other bills recipient has the habit of rounding off and making the payment say supplier supplier is a bank bank is giving a credit card bill the credit card bill is 15625 like that the bill is now what he will do 15625 okay we will pay 16000 like that the recipient has paid to the bank 16000 now how much bank got extra money bank has got extra money to some extent on that extra money actually that is pertaining to the next month bill that extra money whatever is received that 375 rupees whatever is received is pertaining to next month bill but this month itself is is received logically they need to pay gst on that extra amount received this month because invoice comes in the future but they have been given a proviso they have been given a relaxation that is if the excess payment is up to 1000 rupees per invoice in our example how much is the excess amount 375 rupees which is up to 1000 in that case the supplier is having two options take time of supply as the date of invoice so whenever you raise invoice at the time itself is a time of supply for the 375 rupees or normal provision normal provision which means what date of receipt or date of invoice whichever is earlier so this month is the date of receipt so this month itself gst is payable got it so this month we received money we will raise invoice in future so this month itself we need to pay gst that is normal provisions or you go for date of invoice but which year it will not go for date of invoice definitely everyone will go for date of invoice only so anyhow let them let them let that be reflected in the next month invoice at that time itself we will pay gst why we need to pay gst this month got it so for administrative convenience this point has been added please see up to 1000 rupees received in excess of the invoice in case of services covered under fcm services here it is applicable only in case of services okay not in case of any other thing only in case of services then time of supply can be date of invoice or that is determined under subsection 2 of 13 normal provisions or date of invoice supplier has the option to choose between what it then next one in case of supply of services between associated enterprises in case of supply of services between associated enterprises what is that associated enterprises means which means that you know as per section 92a of the income tax act two people are said to be associated you know when one holds minimum 26% in the other but that is a definition under income tax act but which is not required for you in exam that will be given as associated enterprises two people are associated enterprises and there is an import of service from associated enterprise so there are two associated enterprise one outside india and the other in india import of services liability to pay gst under rcm so therefore we need to take 133 services rcm 133 but what we have a proviso which says that in case of transaction between associated enterprise usually invoices will not be there so don't take 61st day from the date of invoice take the date on which entry is passed in the books of recipient so the date on which generally rcm generally rcm what will be taken as time of supply the date on which recipient makes payment or 61st day from the date of invoice whichever is earlier correct in this case between associated enterprises we need to take date on which recipient makes a payment to supplier or the date of entry in the books of the recipient whichever is earlier should be taken okay so see that in case of supply of services between associated enterprise where supplier is outside in india and recipient is in india time of supply shall be date of entry in the books of recipient or date of payment to supplier whichever is earlier should be taken then next when goods are taken outside india for exhibition so goods are taken outside india for exhibition purpose and is it supplied no it is not supplied when the goods are taken outside india for exhibition it is not supplied but but 31 subsection 7 comes into picture 
If the goods are not brought back within six months, it is deemed as supply. Got it? If the goods are not brought back within six months, why? What does 31 subsection 7 says? Sir, in case of sale on approval or on return basis, the, time, the due date of invoice will be as and when the supply takes place or six months from the date of removal, whichever is earlier. So, there is a deeming fiction inbuilt in that. Within six months, if the goods are not returned to the supplier's place, it is deemed that the supply has taken place like that. When the goods are taken outside India for exhibition, are you bringing those goods within six months? Yes. Super. Not a supply. Otherwise, if you are not bringing within six months, on expiry of six months, it is treated as supply as per section 31 subsection 7 and we need to raise the invoice. Okay. And pay the GST accordingly. So, that is this. Point number five. Okay. So, these are the aspects related to time of supply. We completed time of supply section 12 and section 13 and due date of invoice section 31 subsection 3 that is subse uh, subsection 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 we completed that is time of supply we completed then due date of invoice 31 subsection 147 for goods and 256 for services we completed that and subsection 3 is pending okay now we are moving on to various documents involved in GST so tax invoice already we completed so, when the tax invoice will be issued, so tax invoice is issued whenever a person is making supply of taxable goods or services and if supplier is registered, supplier will be giving tax invoice to the recipient. Suppose if the supplier is unregistered and the transaction is covered under RCM, then the recipient shall issue an invoice to the supplier, got it? Generally. Who will be giving invoice to whom? Supplier will be giving invoice to the recipient. But if the supplier is unregistered and the transaction is covered under RCM, then the recipient will be giving the tax invoice to the supplier. That is this. What is the time limit? Already we know the time limit. Suppose if the registered person is making exempted supplies, then in that case, a bill of supply shall be issued. <coughs> so whenever the registered person is making exempted supplies then what is the name of the document bill of supply bill of supply is the name of the document that will be given by supplier to recipient and what is the time limit same time limit even a person who is opting for composition scheme is also required to give bill of supply okay so first a person who is making supply of exempted goods or services or paying tax under composition scheme shall give bill of supply okay Next, because composition, a person who is opting for composition scheme cannot charge GST to the recipient na, due to that reason. They cannot charge GST to the recipient due to that reason they will be, you know, giving bill of supply rather than tax invoice. Then, suppose if there is a low value supply, what is the low value supply? Value of supply less than 200, not equal to 200 or greater than 200. Value of supply, that is per supply is less than 200. Then in that case, tax invoice is not mandatory, but, but a consolidated tax invoice should be prepared at the end of the day. For example, there is a supermarket. One customer is coming and purchasing some commodities, 2-3 commodities, 120 rupees like that. Now, that supermarket may not give tax invoice, provided that the recipient is unregistered. So, it should be a B2C supply means what? The recipient is unregistered and the recipient do not require tax invoice. But all those low value supplies, a consolidated tax invoice will be prepared at the end of the day. At the end of that particular day, consolidated tax invoice containing all the details of low value supplies will be prepared at the end of the day. Okay. So, that is about the consolidated tax invoice in case of low value supplies. Understood or not? Then, so in case of low value supplies, that is value of supply less than 200, tax invoice as well as bill of supply not required if the recipient is unregistered, comma, recipient is not in need of invoice. So, first condition, recipient is unregistered. The second condition, recipient is not in need of invoice and a consolidated invoice needs to be raised by the, at the end of the day. A consolidated invoice needs to be raised at the end of the day. 
in case of multiplex theaters in case of multiplex theaters that provision of non issuance of invoice in case of low value supply is not applicable and they should give the invoice even though the ticket price is less than 200 see in a multiplex theater usually it will not happen but in some places maybe the ticket price is less than 200 so particularly in chennai if you see in some multiplex theaters the ticket price is less than 200 it is somewhere around 170 or 180 like that so therefore it is less than 200 in that case you know even though it is a low value supply but tax invoice is required E ticket, whatever is given, will be deemed to be the tax invoice in that case. See this. In case of multiplex theaters and invoice, E ticket is deemed as invoice to be issued even if the value of supply is less than 200 rupees. Then next, debit note and credit note already we discussed in value of supply. So whenever supplier increases the invoice value by charging an extra amount to the recipient, by charging extra amount from the recipient, supplier will be giving a debit note to the recipient. Whenever supplier reduces the invoice value, so as the recipient's balance shows debit balance, and if the recipient's balance come down, we will credit, so we will give a credit note to the recipient. So that's about debit note and credit note. For debit note, there is no time limit, but for credit note, there is a time limit. What is the time limit? So this is just like the input tax credit time limit, so section 16 subsection 4 we have seen an input tax credit time limit what is that time limit for availment of idc 20th october of the succeeding financial year or date of filing annual return whichever is earlier is there now so that one okay so that like that but it is not 20th october it is end of september 30th september of the succeeding financial year or date of filing annual return whichever is earlier that's a connection so time limit for availment of ITC is 20th October of the succeeding financial year date of filing and return which is earlier. Whereas in case of credit note it is 30th September of the succeeding financial year or date of filing annual return which is earlier that will be taken. Then sir against multiple invoices can I give a single debit note or credit note? Yes. I gave five invoices. For all these five invoices now I want to pass on a cash discount. I can give a single credit note. Or for five invoices, I am charging a single interest. I can give a single debit note. Okay. That is this. One or more credit note, debit note can be issued for multiple invoices. Then there is something called as revised tax invoice. Revised tax invoice. What is this revised tax invoice? Whenever a person is liable to get registered and he makes application for registration within 30 days. Now, Whatever is the outward supplies from the date he is liable to register until the time he get the registration certificate, that period. Whatever is the period, for example, today I crossed threshold limit and I am liable to register. I make application for registration within 30 days. Now I get registration certificate. Say on, on 5th of May, 5th of May, so I cross the threshold limit. Okay, on 5th of May, for example, I am telling for 5th of May and I made application for registration on 4th of June and the registration certificate is granted on 7th June. Now from 4th June, 4th May, sorry 5th May to 7th June, from 5th May to 7th June, whatever is the outward supplies, with respect to those outward supplies, we can give revised tax invoice after the date we get registration certificate because Without getting registration certificate, we cannot give a tax invoice and recover the GST. But we need to pay GST for this period. For this period, we need to pay GST. But we cannot recover the GST from the recipient by giving tax invoice. So what is the last is? You give a revised tax invoice when? After the date of registration. What is the date of registration? That is 7th June is the date of registration. I got registration certificate on 7th June. From that 7th June within one month, you give the revised tax invoice for the supplies made before 7th June, for the supplies made before 7th June, after 5th May, before 7th June, whatever supplies we made, after 7th June, you give the revised tax invoice within one month. So that these supplies, you are paying GST and by giving revised tax invoice, you can recover the GST from the customer. But practically, it is not possible because the customer says, go to hell, I will not pay GST. So theoretically, they gave it. 
and now this revise tax invoice is possible only if the application is made within 30 days if the application for registration is not made within 30 days then this concept of revised tax invoice is not applicable revised tax invoice cannot be issued if application for registration not made within 30 days from the date on which liability to register arises okay so therefore what is the time limit within which revised tax invoice should be given within one month from the date of certificate of registration okay then next there is and in this regard we need to know the effective date of registration also sir generally what is the effective date of registration if you make application for registration within one month in our example what is the date on which we cross the threshold limit 5th may and we made application on 4th june within 30 days now what will be the effective date of registration 5th may the date on which you are liable to get registered that date will be taken as the effective date of registration suppose if application for registration is not made within 30 days if application for registration is not made within 30 days then in that case what will happen then if the application for registration is not made within 30 days then in that case you know with the effective date of registration is the date on which you got the registration certificate so the date when you get the registration certificate that's the reason why you know you cannot give the revised tax invoice okay that is the effective date of registration which you can see here what is the effective date of registration if applied within 30 days from the date when liable the date on which such person liable to register will be taken if applied beyond 30 days the date on which registration is granted will be taken then next receipt voucher what is this receipt voucher generally when we receive an advance what is the evidence to the recipient that we received the advance so some kind of proof we need to give na? that is known as receipt voucher so whenever supplier receives an advance from the recipient against that advance a receipt voucher will be given to the recipient only if the payment is received before invoice it is called as advance if the payment is received after invoice that is not called as advance so in that case the receipt voucher is not required okay then time limit not specified but immediately it should be given payment voucher what is this payment voucher sir whenever the recipient is liable to pay gst under rcm 9394 whenever the recipient is liable to pay gst under 9394 recipient will be giving some advance to the supplier na? some payment any payment recipient will be making a payment to the supplier and therefore recipient should give a payment voucher to the supplier because he made a payment so he gives a payment voucher and gets a certification from the supplier got it then refund voucher that is i collected advance still invoice is not at issue i collected advance still invoice is not at issue i gave a receipt voucher now i am cancelling the supply and i am giving refund of this amount now in that case the refund voucher will be given provided the invoice is not at raised if the invoice is already raised then don't give refund voucher give a credit note because you are cancelling the invoice so give a credit note okay so if amount is refunded after issuance of tax invoice then a credit note shall be issued by the supplier to the recipient okay then there is a CBAC clarification which says that if GST is already paid on advance and we are giving refund voucher can we get refund of the GST paid yes because in case of services what will be taken as the time of supply the date on which payment is received or the date of invoice whichever is earlier so when the advance is received in case of services they need to pay GST on advance but the supply is cancelled now in that case the refund voucher is given now whatever GST that is paid on advance we will get as a refund this is as per CBAC clarification. So this is about refund voucher. Then there is something called as delivery chalan. So whenever there is a transportation of goods, movement of goods without supply, say within the state, I have multiple place of business and I did not get separate registration. So from the head office to the branch, when the goods are being transported without you know, supply, that is not a supply then in that case that transportation should accompany a delivery chalan remember whenever there is a movement of goods but not under supply that is so goods are sent to the job worker 
it is not a supply for processing in that case a delivery challan should be there they are taking the goods to the recipient place but we don't know how much quantity the recipient will buy then also in that case also that goods should accompany a delivery challan then any other transportation without supply without involving supply that should accompany a delivery challan who should be giving the delivery challan to whom supplier should be giving the delivery challan to the recipient okay that is this delivery challan point so these are the various documents that is involved in gst now there is a new amendment called as e invoice there is a new amendment called as e invoice so that e invoice concept we are going to discuss so this is for your may 21 that is the july whatever exam for that this is applicable but this position has completely changed for november 21 exam so i am not con confusing you by telling that amendment for november 21 exam that i'll discuss separately for those students who are appearing for november 21 so this particular e invoice and qr code which is applicable for your exam is what i am discussing but actually this got changed again first we need to understand what is this e invoice e invoice does not mean invoice generated electronically that is not e invoice you will generate a normal invoice using your accounting software but only thing that invoice will be prepared as per a particular format whatever invoice you generate in your accounting software that invoice will be prepared as per the accounting like a proper format so in your accounting software itself you incorporate the template you incorporate the template e invoice schema template accordingly you prepare the invoice okay so see the procedure involved see the procedure involved with respect to e invoicing see this see this procedure involved with respect to e invoicing what will happen sir tax payer will generate a invoice using his erp or billing system tax payer will generate a invoice using his erp or billing system but that will be as per the prescribed format what field should be there etc based on that this is a normal invoice that will be converted into a machine readable format called as jspon jspon sir what is that jspon that's a format for example you know windows applications are under a .exe then document microsoft office document will be .docx ppt dot pptx excel means dot xls like that an extension is there na and if it is android application dot sdk like that like that so there is something called as an extension that is a particular format in which we will convert that is known as dot json format okay so this json is a particular format it's a java format java format okay so java script enabled format it is and in that format it will be converted and any any type of machine any type of machine can read that format that's why it is converted into because any type of software it can be any accounting software say i am using erp you are using tally another person is using pickbook z another person is using some other zoho books any person can read this for that reason only it is converted into a unified common format that is dot json so uploads e invoice json to invoice registration portal so they need to convert that into json and upload it into the invoice registration portal and once they upload it into the invoice registration portal what that invoice registration portal will do they will do deduplication check with this gst system that is whatever this invoice it might have already been uploaded and again if we can up, we cannot upload for example you know whenever we already we already you know got uh, we already got say particular vaccination i'll tell you we already got vaccinated when you use the same number we will not get or better example in a way you can understand say you have got one uh, coupon so that coupon you redeemed again when you enter that coupon you cannot redeem because already you redeemed like that already 
for that invoice if e invoice number is generated that is known as invoice reference number already if it is generated they will not generate it again that way they will cross check with the gst system okay now what invoice registration portal will do they will do d duplication check hope you understood d duplication check and they will be attaching to that invoice three things invoice reference number one invoice reference number will be attached and qr code will be attached and it will be digitally signed three things generate invoice reference number then sign with digital signature add qr code and that will be sent to the gst system and e waybill system e waybill is a document to be prepared e waybill is a document e waybill is a document to be prepared by a person who is causing movement of goods so before movement of goods they need to intimate what goods they are moving to which place they need to communicate because that goods may be moved from one place to another place without payment of gst due to that reason they need to communicate to which place they are moving etc that is known as e waybill we have that e waybill concept in the syllabus okay so what they will do from this invoice registration portal the data will be sent to gst system and e waybill system so it will automatically come into the gst server while preparing gstr1 so this supplier this taxpayer while preparing gstr1 automatically it will come okay so see that gst system has stored in the gst invoice registry d duplication check gst system now has a unique invoice with a unique number gstr1 will be updated by the seller got it so automatically gstr1 this invoice data will come and even in gstr 2b to the buyer also this data will automatically come so they don't have to do anything so once this invoice is uploaded in the invoice registration portal that invoice registration portal will generate three things for that invoice called as <laughs> invoice reference number qr code and digital signature and send that information to the gst system and eway bill system so when it is sent to the gst system what will happen in the gst system the data will automatically come in gstr1 of the supplier and it will go to the gstr 2b of the respective recipient now what recipient can do what buyer can do view registered invoice from irp use qr code to verify the invoice and view the itc related to this invoice in his 3p 2b and he can enjoy that credit who recipient now supplier supplier automatically it will come into gstr1 and supplier should make the payment of gst so mainly to escape from fake invoices many people what they were doing so they will create some fake registrations in the name of that fake registrations they will raise the invoice and the recipient will take the credit but these people will file only gstr1 they will not file gstr 3b gstr1 when they file the data will automatically come to the recipient and recipient will enjoy the credit but the supplier will not pay tax to avoid this fake invoice and that will be headache for the department to go in search of those people so that's why they brought in this concept of e invoicing so this is the process you need to remember this maybe some common based questions will be asked or they will ask invoice registration portal shall assign few details to the invoice explain those details so just three points you need to write okay so this is the process of e invoicing so when an invoice will be called as a e invoice a normal invoice when it has three things it will be called as a e invoice invoice registration number qr code and digital signature that will be called as a e invoice now who is mandatorily required to do this who is mandatorily required to do this this e invoicing and all sir if the aggregate turnover during the preceding year aggregate turnover during a financial year that is not use of a preceding year any preceding year any preceding year aggregate turnover during any preceding year current year we are in so see the preceding year any preceding year if the aggregate turnover does not exceed 100 crores e invoice is not required and even on the invoice qr code also not required then 
if the aggregate turnover during any financial year exceeds 100 crores but does not exceed 500 crores if it is b to b supplied then e invoicing is required okay if it is b to c e invoice not required even qr coding invoice not required suppose if aggregate turnover during any previous year exceeds 500 crores for b to b invoice required in case of b to c e invoice not required but on the invoice we need to mention the qr code just to, to check whether it is an authentic invoice or not that qr code alone needs to be attached an image qr code image needs to be added that's it so qr code is not e invoicing so just when it has a qr code it is not e invoicing because e invoicing means three things should be there invoice reference number qr code and digital signature just when you put a qr code you are putting supplier is putting that qr code so that is just to, to check the authenticity of that invoice that qr code is fixed okay so when the aggregate turnover during any previous year exceeds 500 crores b2b invoicing b2c qr code just qr code if it exceeds 100 but does not exceed 500 b2b e invoicing e invoice is required and in case of b2c e invoicing is not required but qr code in invoice is qr code in invoice is also not required e invoice required if it does not exceed 100 crores nothing is required okay just this chart you remember so that you will understand who is required to generate e invoice who is required to generate e invoice aggregate turnover during any previous year starting from 1718 because gst is applicable from 1718 only now so 1718 exceeds 100 crores and when qr code e invoice is required if the aggregate turnover during any previous year starting from 1718 exceeds 500 crores then qr code e invoice is required now even if it exceeds 100 crores or 500 crores, e invoice and QR code is not required in few cases. What are they? Sir, irrespective of the aggregate turnover, irrespective of the aggregate turnover, e invoice and QR code not required in case of following supplies. Following suppliers. So, to these people, banking company, financial institution, or in BFC. So, banking companies, banking sector, then GTA, goods transport agency, and any person who is into the business of transportation of passengers, then multiplex cinema theatres, cinema theatres, and ACZ units. These five suppliers are not required to do e-invoicing and QR code. This concept of e-invoicing and QR code is not applicable to them. Who are they? Banking sector, then next uh, GTA, transportation of passengers, airways, railways, etc. And then multiplex theatres, cinema theatres and ACZ unit. Okay. Then, what is QR code, quick reference code to be generated from the government's portal? E-invoice, electronic invoice to be generated from the government's portal. What is aggregate turnover? ATO means aggregate turnover. B2B, B2C, you can understand. B2B is recipient is registered. B2C means recipient is not registered. So, this two page information, you please remember here, this is an amendment, I expect a question for this attempt, definitely you will be getting, okay. So, then there is one amendment in this regard, section 31A, section 31A, new section added, they are telling, to some notified class of registered persons, there are some notified class of registered persons. Those notified class of registered persons should accept always the payment in account form that is digital only. Cash is disallowed. Only digital payment. They have to give multiple digital payment options and collect the money in digital payment. Cash payment not allowed. Okay, that is 31A. The government may, on the recommendations of the council, prescribe a class of registered persons who shall provide prescribed modes of electronic payment to the recipient of supply of goods or services okay to the recipient to the uh, recipient of such goods or services or both made by him and give option to such recipient to make payment accordingly prescribed modes of electronic payment Sir, everyone, sir, no, only certain class of registered persons and give option to such person to make the payment accordingly. Got it? 
But who are those, sir? It is not yet notified here. Don't worry. It is not yet notified. It is not yet notified. Okay. So who are those? Who are those registered class of persons or not yet notified? But the section is there. The section is there. But who are those class of registered persons is not yet notified. So government may prescribe. So first they will tell. You know the e-commerce transactions already it is in place. They are not officially notified, but it is in place. Many cases cash on delivery option is not allowed. E-payment like uh, Amazon, Flipkart, and all. Many cases cash on delivery they are not doing. So because voluntarily these people are doing. Even tomorrow, government may tell that all e-commerce operators are not required to collect cash payments. Like that, they will slowly bring one by one. Okay. Then, next, uh, there is some amendment in HSN code in tax invoice. What is that general provision? If, that is, if aggregate turnover during the previous year does not exceed 1.5 crores, in the invoice, we don't have to enter the HSN code. In invoice, we need to mention HSN and HAG. HSN refers to Harmonized system of nomenclature code for every product, one HSN code will be there given by the government. Same way for every service and SAC, service accounting code will be there. In the invoice, we need to mention HSN and SAC for goods and services. But for HSN, there is a relaxation. What is that? If the aggregate turnover does not exceed 1.5 crores, HSN is not required. If the aggregate turnover exceeds 1.5 crores but does not exceed 5 crores, two digits you need to enter. Two digits you need to enter. And if aggregate turnover during the previous year exceeds 5 crores, four digits to be entered. So that is the provision, existing provision. That is only applicable for your exam. What is that applicable for your exam? HSN coding invoice. What is applicable? Listen. HSN code in invoice, HSN code, HSN code in invoice, what is that provision, HSN code in invoice, sir if the aggregate turnover, aggregate turnover during previous year, aggregate turnover during previous year and HSN code, Aggregate turnover during previous year does not exceed 1.5 crores, then HSN code is not at all required. See, this is only applicable for, you know, this July 21 exam. July 2021 exam, this concept is only applicable. Aggregate turnover during previous year does not exceed 1.5 crores, HSN code is nil. If the aggregate turnover during previous year exceeds 1.5 crores and does not exceed 5 crores, then you need to enter two digits. Two digits. So generally, HSN code is a how many digit number? HSN code is an eight digit number here. HSN code is generally eight digit number. Generally, eight digit number. 8 digit number okay but you need to enter only the two digits when if the aggregate turnover during the previous year does not exceed 5 crores if the aggregate turnover during the previous year exceeds 5 crores if the aggregate turnover during the previous year exceeds 5 crores how many digits should be entered four digits sir this is only applicable for may that is july 2021 exam but for November 21 exam there is a change so that's why definitely this concept can be asked in the current exam so from November 21 exam onwards there is a change in that okay so those students who are appearing for November 21 you please remember this but as this batch is predominantly for July students so therefore this is the provision which is applicable for your exam okay then next Instead of issuing credit voucher, sorry, instead of giving refund voucher, instead of giving refund voucher, okay, instead of issuing 
instead of issuing credit note not credit voucher here sorry instead of issuing credit note instead of issuing credit note refund can be claimed what is that sir first i collected advance sir and giving refund voucher i will go for refund normal already i gave the invoice now i need to give a credit note that's the provision but there is a relaxation which they are telling either you go for credit note because there is a time limit for credit note now either you go for credit note or you can go for refund refund of the gst paid that is this okay so an advance is received by a supplier for a service contract which subsequently got cancelled the supplier has issued the invoice supplier has issued the invoice before supply of service and paid gst then on whether he can claim refund of the tax paid or he is required to adjust the tax liability by giving credit note either either he can give either he can give a credit note or he can go for refund but it's either credit note here either credit note or refund refund under excess payment of tax file a claim under excess payment of tax refund they can get the refund either credit note if they give credit note what will happen in the month in which credit note is given the liability will come down if they go for refund whatever gst already they paid that they will get as a cash refund okay so they can decide which option they want then second an advance is received an advance is received by a supplier for a service contract which got cancelled subsequently the supplier has issued receipt voucher and paid gst on such advance received whether he can claim refund of the tax paid on advance or he is required to adjust his liability in the returns that is advance is received the supplier has issued a receipt voucher not invoice and what will be the case give a refund voucher and go for only refund refund of gst already paid that's what this is goods supplied by a supplier under the cover of tax invoice are returned by the recipient so either give a credit note or go for refund either give a credit note or go for refund so this information we will just document in a simple manner what is a credit note versus refund voucher credit note credit note versus refund voucher credit note versus refund voucher what is that that is sir say there is a date of invoice sir there is a date of invoice before the date of invoice before the date of invoice before the date of invoice okay if the payment is received if the payment is received before the date of invoice payment received payment received before the date of invoice then in that case if payment is received if payment is received before the date of invoice supplier shall issue shall shall supplier shall issue a receipt voucher to recipient supplier shall issue supplier shall issue receipt voucher to recipient receipt voucher to recipient okay supplier shall issue what receipt voucher to recipient supplier shall issue receipt voucher to whom to recipient suppose if the payment is received and and on this whether gst paid in case of goods no in case of goods gst not paid in case of services gst paid goods services in case of goods here gst not paid gst not paid why sir in case of goods whenever advance is received this is what advance 
payment received before the date of advance is known before payment received before the date of invoice is known as what advance payment received before the date of invoice is known as advance in case of that advance with respect to goods gst is not paid with respect to services gst is paid with respect to services gst is paid understood with respect to services gst is paid then this is in case of payment received before the date of invoice if the payment is received after the date of invoice if the payment is received balance payment received payment received after the date of invoice what is that balance balance with respect to that balance what will happen if the payment is received after the date of invoice as on 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 the date of invoice a document needs to be given as on the date of invoice okay already document is issued already that invoice so payment is to be made time of supplies date of invoice gst already paid gst payable gst payable because this will become time of supply this will become time of supply whether receipt voucher is required no supplier may issue not mandatory supplier may issue not mandatory here. supplier may issue supplier may issue receipt voucher receipt voucher to recipient supplier may issue receipt voucher to recipient okay then suppose this is over now if if the amount is refunded if the amount is refunded what will happen if the payment is received suppose before the date of invoice before the date of invoice before the date of invoice if the amount is refunded so amount collected is refunded or amount refunded what will happen if the amount is refunded what will happen before the date of invoice supplier shall issue supplier shall issue refund voucher to recipient supplier shall issue supplier shall issue refund voucher refund voucher to recipient okay refund voucher to recipient and sir whether on the basis of this refund voucher whether we claim whether we claim any refund yes if it is again divided into two goods or services if it is goods or services in case of goods no refund why no refund sir first of all we did not pay gst on advance in case of goods so whenever we give refund voucher no refund no refund but in case of services in case of services already we paid correct already we paid so therefore when we give refund voucher refund claimed refund claimed okay this is simple now when the amount is refunded or supply is cancelled amount refunded or supply cancelled after the date of invoice amount refunded or supply cancelled supply cancelled what will happen when the amount is refunded or the supply is cancelled after the date of invoice two options two options any of these two options can be resorted two options are available what are the two options option 1 option 2 option 1 option 2 any option can be followed option 1 is what supplier shall issue a credit note to recipient that is option 1 supplier shall issue supplier shall issue 
credit note to recipient credit note to recipient supplier shall issue credit note to recipient what will happen when a credit note is issued when a credit note is issued supplier shall issue a credit note and when a credit note is issued to the recipient automatically when the credit note is issued to the recipient so liability gets reduced liability gets reduced so we will not get refund liability gets reduced alternatively we can go for refund refund can be claimed refund can be claimed so this is that circular this is that circular whatever we have seen so that i have just summarized into this okay so with this we completed invoice and time of supply in the next video we will be proceeding to the mcqs and the question answers related to invoice and time of supply